everybody's gone quiet, so I guess that's a, that means that we should start. Uh, my name is Les Furbank. I'm an agroecologist from the UK, and one of my, I'm not particularly concerned with permaculture or organic. I tend to look at a whole host of farming systems, and one of the key things I'm interested in is how different systems work, what they seek to achieve, and how well they get there. And uh, I happen to be based quite close to uh, the Permaculture Association headquarters. I'm doing quite a bit with uh, with some of the people up there. So when they said, would you like to come down and chair this session? I said, yeah, that sounds great. It'd be really interesting to hear what people are up to, what's going on. I'm afraid for this session, we only have <coughs> two stories that we're going to be given uh, because uh, Paolo unfortunately can't make it. So instead of just having two star three stories with limited time for question, we will get two stories and after these two lectures there will be a short period of questions just on technical details and then we'll go into a longer discussion on some of the issues that may have been brought up. So in other words, instead of having two stories we'll probably have about 30 odd. Uh, there's plenty of seats as long as you're prepared to move in and squeeze in. My a ten-minute warning? <laughs> Good grief! I've even got a sign for it. <laughs> <laughs> Just so I know whether to speed up or. Right. Okay. All right. Ten-minute warning. It is. You can flash that up. At I me. can. Oh. <laughs> so, if I start, so if I start waving this around, <laughs> I'm an experienced host. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Cut it. Whether you're going to like that. <laughs> Yeah, there's still more seats in here, so if everybody can come on in. Yes. There's some seats over here. So, so both speakers are going to tell us about permaculture in Europe and both are near the south coasts of their respective countries and both are undertaking both uh, research and market gardening. So we're going to start with uh, Rebecca Lawton who's based basically in Dorset so a little bit wetter than here, a little bit mm. warmer than here generally fairly nice compared with Leeds where I come from <laughs> and then we'll get to the really nice place later on. <laughs> Over to you Rebecca. Well thank you for all coming along. Um, yes I'm Rebecca and um, I'm speaking on behalf of the Land Workers Alliance who I'm doing this research on productivity for and I just thought I'd start off by giving a brief overview of the Land Workers Alliance to explain why I'm so interested in productivity of small farms. Um, we're effectively a union for small and medium scale ecological or agroecological land workers. That's not just farmers and growers, but also woodland workers, land based craft workers. And we've got over 400 members, but we're still a very new organisation. We've only been going for two years. And we're trying to get food sovereignty into the food production agenda in the UK. Um, so our activities include campaigning and creating solidarity for small-scale land workers. Um, and this is where the productivity comes in, because in the UK, our, um, our government, or the Department for Environment, Food and Rural Affairs, who oversee agriculture, seem to have quite a strong policy bias against small-scale producers. And in fact, in the recent CAP reforms, they 
just stopped giving subsidies altogether to farms of five hectares and less. Um, but we know that small farms can actually be highly productive and highly diverse as well as highly sustainable. Um, and there's, there's already data showing that there's an inverse relationship between farm size and productivity in some tropical countries. But when I started looking into data in the UK, it seemed that there just isn't very much data, even though there are lots of claims made for small-scale agroecological farms. So fortunately, the Centre for Agroecology, Water and Resilience mm -hmm. saw that there was um, also a need for this research. So they're funding me um, to do this um, on behalf of the Land Workers Alliance. So why study small farms? This is a question that um, provokes quite strong feelings amongst people. It seems that there's productivism phobia amongst environmentalists, and this is really quite understandable because when you think about the history of agriculture, post-war agriculture, the push to increase productivity has brought a lot of really bad environmental and social impacts, ranging from large-scale mechanisation of agriculture, use of fertilisers, pesticides, ripping out of hedgerows. And um, so it's not, it's not surprising that as soon as you start thinking about productivity, people think, oh, well, no, but we're, we're about so much more than just productivity. We're about biodiversity and soil care. But I think productivity is really, really important if we're going to be taken seriously by policymakers, because we can be as sustainable as we like, but if we don't actually produce food, then we're not going to get the chance. And as pressure increases on land, those that are not so productive are going to not get the chance to farm. So I think it's absolutely vital that we record productivity. Um, so eco farms have many, many functions, um, like I listed just before, um, biodiversity, soil care, um, carbon capture, um, and, well, I won't list them because I'm sure you're all familiar with them. Um, but food production and financial productivity, I think, are actually also key to sustainability. Um, interestingly, earlier this summer when I was discussing this issue in a workshop, um, one of the Italian delegates came up with a very um, valuable concept, which was well, what are you measuring productivity against? And what you really need to be looking at is scarce parameters. So are you looking at productivity per unit land or per unit energy or per unit labour or um, for how much productivity you get for the subsidies you put in? And at the moment, the British government looks at efficiency in terms of labour efficiency, not in terms of land efficiency, which in my mind seems pretty crazy when we're not really very short of people in the UK but we are really quite short of land. It's a very small country and we've got a lot of people, we've got a lot of people needing um, satisfying employment. So I think we should be measuring efficiency in terms of land efficiency. I've already mentioned the inverse relationship. So I really strongly believe that future farms have got to be productive and sustainable, or sustainable and productive. It's not okay to just be one or the other. So, oops, sorry, this has slipped off a bit. Um, so I, um, I, un I decided to undertake this research as a survey, and um, I was particularly interested in collecting quantitative data figures of how many kilograms of tomatoes or cheese or um, meat people were getting per unit area. Um, but I also had various qualitative questions, which I'll come to later. And I was hoping to get a large sample. Um, it would have been better to even get more than 100, um, because there are actually um, 20,000 farms of 20 hectares and less in the UK. So even 100 is barely scratching at the surface. Um, and I recruited the, the people to take part in the survey at six regional meetings of the Land Workers Alliance and various other 
conferences and events where I knew that there'd be producers. And be warned, at the end of this, I'm going to be asking you if you're interested to, and if you know people in the UK with holdings of 20 hectares and less, I'm going to repeat the survey in the autumn. So I'm really keen to get in touch with even more smallholders, so please let me know if you know of them. So yes, we went to ran these regional meetings. This is an offshoots permaculture project in um, Burnley in the northwest of England. And it was also a really good chance to get smallholders together. And part of this research is it's very much participatory in that at the end of it, we're going to invite all the people who took part in the survey back to, for, to a Skillshare event to actually exchange information about how they managed to be so productive or find out why they're not more productive even though they're trying to do everything right. So it's not just about extracting information. We really want to feed the information back to the people who take part so that we can sort of up the game with productivity <coughs> throughout the UK. So the areas of questioning, we, um, <coughs> we were looking, as I said, at the physical productivity. We also wanted to look at the enterprise diversity and the crop diversity, because this is one of the things that I think distinguishes ecological farms from more conventional farms. And also looking at the financial productivity of farms. Then, in order to try and explain where we get the variations, I wanted to have some background information on things like the soil quality and um, the, the land quality, the labour and the level, of, the level of experience. And I think the level of experience is actually quite key because the human inputs into a system, I mean, you can quite often have quite poor land, but if you've got a really skillful grower or, um, or farmer looking after animals, you can actually get quite high yields. And I think experience is one of the major inputs into a farming system. And then I was wanting to find out about what the, what the perceived environmental and social benefits for each farm were. And also absolutely key was um, the question about barriers to productivity, because it was quite a risky thing to undertake this research because it might actually reveal that small-scale farms aren't as productive as large-scale farms. And we kind of need to understand why, if they're not, they're not, why the inverse relationship is not working in this country, whereas it works in, in tropical countries. And so finding out why people find it difficult to be more productive, um, I think is going to be really important in future campaigning and trying to get more support for developing small-scale farms. So, the results. Um, I hope you'll forgive me if I go quite fast through these because, um, in a set, well, I'm worried it's going to overrun. But, and there are quite a lot of graphs and quite a lot of figures, but it's more about getting the the overall picture of it. And the thing that I found above all when trying to analyse the results of the survey is that measuring productivity really is very difficult when you're looking at diverse eco farms because so many different foodstuffs and non-foodstuffs come off them and it's very hard to compare a kilo of lettuce with a kilo of meat with a kilo of potatoes with a kilo of cheese um, and you can't just add it all together and say well this farm produces some um, 50 kilos and this farm produces a thousand kilos because they're such different things. Um, so anyway, I will, those are some of the areas I'm going to look through, skim through. So just to give you an idea of the kind of holdings that took part, the one to five hectare holdings were by far the most popular in the survey. We had 40 responses in the end, which was somewhat disappointing um, because I was hoping for a hundred. Unfortunately, the timing all slipped and I ended up putting the survey out in the spring, which was the worst possible time to be asking smallholders to be um, answering questionnaires. Um, so that's why I'm repeating it in the autumn to try and get some more data. But the benefit of it is that I'll be able to hone the questionnaire and make it better and easier to use. So 
just because of this is the permaculture conference, I thought you'd be interested to see a breakdown of the different kinds of eco-management systems. So by far the most popular were certified organic holdings, followed by, I probably shouldn't be calling them organic because they're not certified, but they're people who follow organic principles but are not <coughs> legally certified as such. Then there were four permaculture holdings, four holdings that use permaculture principles, and three each of biodynamic and people who were using agroforestry systems, um, two no dig, one conventional, and then other included quite specific things like biointensive, um, then more sort of vague terms like wildlife friendly, um, but each of those had one. So, um, it's probably not a surprise to see that um, outdoor vegetables were by far the most popular kind of enterprise, followed by um, covered cropping, um, polytunnels or, um, or glass houses. Um, and then soft fruit and top fruit, um, nearly half of all holdings were practicing these. And again, it's not that surprising that only three holdings were, um, were growing cereal crops because 20 hectares is really pretty small for a cereal farm. Um, then other includes a whole variety of different things and this is where we get into the real breadth of things that are going on on, um, on these holdings um, ranging from edible flowers to honey to using the land for allotments for other people to grow on, woodlands, and some value-added products running to wedding catering using, using the produce of the holding. So then there were also a huge diversity of livestock enterprises. Um, chickens, and I mean, to me, the sort of the, the perfect small-scale system would have vegetables and chickens and fruit um, and an orchard for the chickens to um, forage around under. So this was not surprising to me, but there were just so many different kinds of um, livestock enterprises going on. And one of the most productive actually had almost one in every category of those. Um, so, yes, we had 36 commercial growers um, and they were growing a huge range of different vegetables. Um, across the way I measured the vegetable productivity was to pick 10 indicator vegetables rather than trying to get them to write down the yields of every single vegetable they produced. I picked 10 that I thought would be among the more popular ones and asked people to put down their yields for three years um, so that I could average it out to allow for seasonal variation. Um, and then also the area that they were growing that crop on. And that's actually proved to be one of the most valuable parts of the data collection and I'm actually going to extend that um, for the next lot. And interestingly, um, there's a comparative table later on, but on average there were two kilograms per square metre of vegetables over those ten being produced. And compared to um, just ordinary organic yields on a farm that would probably be much, much larger, which was 1.8, there was a slight, um, slightly higher yield. Um, I mean, some, it was incredibly hard to get people to, um, to put down this data, and I was getting very keen for people to take part at the end. And there are a few figures that I'm slightly worried might be inaccurate. I mean, for example, the, the leaf beet and chard, 10 kilograms per square metre is, is a lot, but it's not inconceivable, I think. Um, and 12 and a half kilos of tomatoes per square metre, again, is, is a lot. But um, I think that's, it's possible, certainly. So that's really quite heartening. Yes, so this is comparison of three of the, um, three of the vegetables with um, the standard organic yield. Um, and the averages 
on the whole weren't that great because there were some pretty low yielding ones as well. But then when you look at, um, I, I did a lot of ranking and comparing the productivity rates. Um, so when you look at the top producers and the second and the third producers, there are some pretty, pretty good um, yields coming up. So, I um, yes. Yeah, so for the fruit, the soft fruit really um, came out um, looking pretty good. Um, the average yield was um, point just over point eight of a kilogram, which was a bit smaller than a bit larger than the um, the average for a large farm. Whereas for the top fruit, it was actually quite significantly lower than for a large farm. Top fruit is apples and plums and all the fruit that grows on trees, pears, etc. Um, and they were also producing a huge diversity of different soft fruits, which I think that's one thing that it's extremely labour intensive to pick, let alone to do all the rest of the care for them. So I think it's, it's a very good thing for small farms to specialise in. So this is a, a summary of the productivity for the, um, for the poultry and the animals. I mean, I won't dwell on this for a long time because without having a lot of comparative data, the figures are somewhat meaningless and I'm still very much, this is work in progress and I haven't got a lot of the comparative data for this yet. Um, but this... This is a very brief summary comparing it to data from the Organic Farm Management Handbook. Um, and you can see small farms don't ca categorically come out on top as being the most productive. Um, but I think, I think there's quite a lot more unpacking of the data that needs to be done. So this is actually where I find it gets most interesting. And in ranking the productivity of the holdings for different um, livestock and pro vegetables and fruit and dairy, um, you started to find patterns emerging that um, some holdings were consistently more productive and coming out top um, and second and third. And so the next three slides are just showing three of the more productive holdings. Um, this one, I only realised quite recently that it was only their second year of production, um, and I think it's pretty good that they'd actually come out um, on top, well, second highest for vegetable production. They were doing really well on their um, duck and hen egg production. And although their net annual income is still pretty low, really, I mean, that's what they have to live on. Um, this is only their second year of production and a lot of businesses run at a loss for the first um, two or three or four years. So to be achieving that at this stage I think is pretty good. And they are producing a phenomenal amount of, um, of food and selling it by farmers markets to the local people. Um, this one just really blew me away. I mean they've been going for a bit longer but they were producing a whole variety of different meat and um, poultry products, um, eggs. And they were really producing a very good livelihood. Um, I mean, they were buying in feed, so that wasn't all completely from their land. So the, the hen and the, um, I think, turkey food was being brought in. Um, but nevertheless, to be producing that amount from one holding, and they were still managing to be um, sustainable in quite a lot of criteria at the same time. And then this one um, came out as being um, quite a highly productive holding, um, but much more diverse. This was the one that they were doing the catering for weddings, and they're, they're making cheese from some of their milk, They've got pigs that use the whey from the cheese. Um, they've got sheep and chickens that range on the same pasture under the top fruit. 
and then they make a lot of jams and chutneys and so forth from the um, from the soft fruit. So, and I mean, there's a family living on that income. But again, um, I thought that that was that was really quite an interesting example of a highly productive holding. So, um, the qualitative results, which I have to admit, I'm. I feel much more at home when doing qualitative research. Stepping into collecting figures is a bit of a foreign land for me, so um, I've been sort of, yes, learning quickly how to do it as I've been going along, whereas I feel like I'm much more on home territory here. Um, so one of the questions I was really keen to find out, because it works much better, um, I think, with small-scale labour-intensive systems, is um, polycropping methods because machines just can't really cope with complex polycropping. But I wanted to find out whether this was just a myth that we sort of all promulgate or whether it actually happens. So I was asking, I asked people about polycropping methods and I'll move on to this. And yes, there were, okay, thank you. There were a phenomenal amount of um, different kinds of. Um, polycropping methods. I mean, some of them much more traditional, such as succession sowing and um, the rotation of a mixed farm. But then there was also some quite thing, interesting things going on, like um, one, of the, one of the respondents kept, keeps cattle and also does some um, coppice work, and he feeds quite a lot of the foliage when he does the coppicing to his cattle, which I thought was a really nice integration of, um, of enterprises. Um, and more traditional thing, having poultry or sheep um, grazing in orchards, um, alley cropping between apple trees, and it's it's an area I'd really like to look a lot more into in the UK to collect data on actually how much can how much can be collected from polycropping and how much can yields increase. I have to admit, my exam my trial with polycropping in my garden this year really was not a very successful one and it's made me think I'm actually going to go back to doing one thing per bed. Um, this is it. I tried to grow lettuces and um, French beans under sugar snap peas and um, actually found that French beans haven't done well at all. But, um, but you live and learn and you keep evolving your systems. Um, so yes, this is chickens grazing under an orchard. Um, which I think is a really, really good use of land. There are so many co-benefits with the chickens eating the pests, um, fertilising the orchard, keeping the grass down. Um, and actually that's the kind of thing that could happen on quite a large scale, really. It doesn't have to just happen in a small scale. So yes, now we get to the real crux of the issue. What um, What's stopping people, or what do people perceive as stopping them from producing more? And it's interesting that the, the top categories, which actually, if you think about it, the top three all fall into a fairly similar category because lack of labour and lack of time are two sides of the same coin, and lack of energy. Um, and then low wages means that it's hard to pay for labour, so you then have, it's just different ways of answering the question. Um, so that was, yes, 26 plus, that's 35 respondents fell into that. And there was a general sense that if food prices are higher, then we'd be able to, that labour is actually the main thing that's holding us back from producing <coughs> more food. So limitations of land was mentioned, and lack of space, again, they're, they're two sides of the same coin. And then capital investment, and again, this was interesting because people were feeling that if they had more money to, to invest in efficient um, infrastructure and equipment, they could actually really increase their yields. And a lot of these small farms are just quite undercapitalized, they're starting up often with a piece of land. I mean, a lot of them I know from personal experience, people have to buy a bare piece of land and they have to build their own house and they have to get planning permission for the house and that creates a huge drain on energy away from production. 
Um, so I think it's quite interesting some of the things that came out from that. A lot of the environmental, social and social benefits really are the kind of things that you'd expect. Um, and again, I'd really emphasise that I see, I see farming and bringing about these environmental and social benefits as the being like the baseline of where we should be at. And then we should be trying, just saying, well, we've got to do this, and then we've got to really increase our productivity on top of it, rather than the productivist philosophy is very much, you've got to produce as much as you can from the land at any cost, and then we might bolt on some sustainability things as an added extra to make ourselves look green. And I think you've got to turn it on its head and say, all of our production systems are going to be sustainable and they're going to be looking after the soil, minimising inputs. Um, but then we've got to, within that system, try and maximise the production. And I think if you look at it that way, productivism is a less sort of poisonous concept. Um, so yes, I mean, there are all sorts of social benefits like better food, community building, local marketing, as well as carbon sequestration. I've got a few slides. Yes, this is at the farm where I work, where two ornithologists walk around pretty much every morning to just see what birds are there. and. Um, and it's, it's a real wildlife resource, as well as being a productive farm. Um, and this is to illustrate the carbon sequestration. This is a really interesting farm in, in Wales, where um, biochar is being used um, and created in wood chip rocket stoves, and then made into compost and used to um, fertilize the land and lock carbon in whilst growing vegetables in a really productive system. So, yes, conclusions so far. Um, when I started off doing this research, I knew it wouldn't be easy, but I also thought, well, you just do a survey and you find that you ask people how much they produce, and then you put it all together and present it. And um, the last few months, I've realized that I realised why quite so many people were saying, are you really sure you want to do that? And so anyway, it really is quite complicated. And because of the diverse range of crops, it's hard to make comparisons. But I still think that it's really worthwhile and really important to be doing it. Um, I've been trying to correlate one thing against another and doing all sorts of scatter graphs and creating co correlation coefficients. and. To be honest, so far I haven't come up with any striking correlations either way, um, which is a bit disappointing, but I mean, I have to remember I've only got 43 responses and actually that is very small in the grand scale of things. So I'm really keen to build up the number of responses. Um, yes, the, the thing that I would like to highlight is that some of the respondents have shown that high productivity on small farms really is p possible and higher productivity than the average on much larger farms. Um, and then we've covered the barriers to productivity and multiple environmental and social benefits. So yes, the, um, there have been quite a few challenges along the way. Piloting the questionnaire in the first place to make sure it worked well um, was quite difficult just because of lack of time and the fact that I had to delay launching the survey um, meant that people just were too busy to respond and also just the fact that I've been really quite surprised that a lot of people just don't keep this kind of data and I don't know whether I'm a bit of a geek in that I'm fascinated by this and I keep all of these records but I would really urge people to start collecting this kind of data because I think if we want to show that we can keep going and producing good quality food, we need to actually be able to show the results. And then, yes, analysing data, dealing with these vast spreadsheets of numbers has been quite a challenge. Um, and finally, the next steps. Um, one of the things that um, Coventry University are quite keen on at the moment, well, the Centre for Agroecology is using film as part of the research method. 
So what we're planning to do is go and film some of the more productive holdings and try and find out exactly why they are so productive and conduct interviews. And these will be used when we do the Skillshare Day to hopefully enable people to really learn and pick up ideas from each other about how to up their productivity. Um, as I've mentioned before, the autumn survey, if you are interested in taking part, please come and give me your email address. And yes, I've mentioned the Skillshare event. So yes, if you forget everything else I've said, these are the three main things that I'd like you to remember from this, that productivity data is really, really important in policy making. Um, a friend of mine who also works for the Land Workers Alliance does a lot of work in, um, in Brussels working with policy makers at a European level and she works, with Via, works on behalf of Via Campesina <coughs> and they talk about all the sustainability benefits they can bring but the policy makers say well look I mean it's all very nice that you do this but unless you can produce the food then we just can't take you seriously um, we've got well, we've got to be feeding people with farming. It can't just be seen as a secondary thing to sustainability. Um, and we do really need to show that agroecology can feed the world, which I really strongly believe it can do, but we need to have the evidence to show that. So thank you very much. we just got a... The issue, the whole issue of getting yield data from small farmers, mm -hmm. I'm not surprising you ran into trouble. I had a, this summer I had a master's student, female master's student out in Romania, talking to some of the small holders out there for the yields. And I remember one of her replies, she got a most unlikely 20 tonnes per hectare, which, which basically is not achieved outside some of the top research institutes on the planet. And by the way, will you marry me? <laughs> Do we have one or two quick technical questions because we want to save the discussions till later? I just wondered how many in those surveys um, were both live or family surveys? How many had both? Had both, yeah. Um, that's a good question and I'm, I should know because I've been looking at this data but I haven't actually, most, yeah, I guess probably about 15 were doing just um, just growing. Okay. Fewer had just livestock, okay. um, but there were a lot of them that were mixed. But there were quite a number that were just horticulture too. There's another one oh. over there. Yeah. I was just wondering how much regulation is actually affected productivity. Um, well, it's a very good question. I mean. I would have thought that some people would have responded that, but actually there weren't that many. There were, there were two or three people, I think, who mentioned that. And one woman wrote a huge long essay. I mean, she was obviously incredibly frustrated. It's amazing how much you can get into a text box on, um, on a survey, but um, it, yes. Especially if you're doing dairy. Sorry? If you're doing dairy. Dairy, yes, uh, or meat, yes. So, no, I mean, they definitely are there, but in terms of the frequency of times they came up in the survey, it was surprisingly less than I was expecting. Two more questions. There's one over there first, and then... Yeah. I just quickly, do you notice any relationship with uh, geographical location? Because, I mean, some of the figures are very encouraging, but obviously depending on the very south, the very north. Yes. Is that the limit? There were a lot more from the southwest, yeah. which isn't surprising because there's a much higher density of small-scale farms in the southwest. But the um, the livestock farm that I gave the example of, that was actually in the north of England. Um, and yes, I mean there were several that were in the north. Um, there weren't that many from the east, which I guess is also not surprising because the east is so dominated by large-scale arable. Um, but Mainly, it was some um, the southwest and a few in the southeast, and quite a few in the north. Okay, and last question. Um, could you mention the problems that they had were energy labor mm -hmm. and uh, investment? Yes. Um, my question is two questions actually. One question: What 
percentage of the farms were operated and run by the family without staff? Mm -hmm. uh, without paid staff? Yes. Or, uh, no, um, not volunteers? Yes. Paid staff? Uh -huh. And uh, how much were volunteers and not paying any staff in their own money? Well, it's. I mean, I'd say probably, and this is just from memory, um, probably about 15 of them didn't employ anyone or didn't have any volunteers. Um, probably about 10 of them employed people, and probably about another 15 of them, um, yeah, about another 15 of them had volunteers, mainly in terms of woofers. Um, although some were also community supported agriculture schemes and some had both paid and some of those had both paid and voluntary. No, 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 I've, I've got to close it there, sorry, we need to move on. I can talk I'll ask you after that. Yes. Yeah. Okay, thank you very much. Okay. So we'll get, we'll get back, back, back at the, later on. But we're moving uh, a bit further south now to the sunny climes of southern Portugal. Yeah, hi everyone. Thank you. How's your energy levels? Can you show me? Yeah. If you want, you can stand up and just shake a little bit. Just it's after lunch. It's always difficult to to get the brain working after lunch. So, if you feel like moving a little bit, please do so. Um, yeah. So. As it was said before, like uh, I come from the south of Portugal, and uh, I first would like to thank you all for, for coming here. And I would like to thank also the land and the Thames for hosting us here, and uh, for, for helping us to also arrive a little bit to Portugal and to our, to our story in Portugal. Um, I have, there's, there's, a, there's a type of song that is sung uh, in, the, in the southern land, landscapes of Portugal that actually the movement while singing, it mi mimics the landscape and mimics the grass movement of the landscape. And it's a bunch of people, you know, holding arms and it's a collaborative effort. And it's, it's, it was very realiven uh, after the revolution when, when there was a big campesinos movement and the occupation of lands and, the, and the, this renewal of the, the agricultural reform in Portugal at that time. Uh, so. I, I'm going to invite you, it takes one minute, and I'm going to invite you to close your eyes and embark with me in that journey. And uh, we'll just arrive there one minute from now. Em cada dia que passa E ao cheire no alegre Transformamos um deserto num delicado jardim. O alentejo é a terra dos pais dos nossos avós. Por ela sent in this type of landscape. It's an uh, agro-silva pastoral landscape. It's called Montado. It's ma mainly cork oaks or elm oaks. And underneath, there's pasture of pigs, of black pigs, and other, other uses. So there's a lot of beekeeping and uh, harvesting of wild mushrooms and, uh, and uh, also some cereals growing. Uh, like the, what I'm talking, what I'm coming here to talk to you today is about a survey that I'm doing. It's within my, my PhD study. So I'm doing a survey of the, of the permaculture movement in Portugal. And um, 
trying to get a, f a sense of what are the highlights and the grassroots innovations that are coming up from the, the, the movement in Portugal. So uh, I live in the south of Portugal. It's uh, by, by the delta of a river uh, in a small farm, a uh, four hectare farm that I'm renting. And it's just by the side of a permaculture educational project that has 44 hectares. And uh, I'm going to go back to that. Although I'm not going to focus today on what we are doing here, I'm going to focus on the, on the survey itself. So, so the survey, it's part also of, the, of a project, an European project called, uh, called BASE. It's Bottom-Up Adaptation Strategy for Sustainable Europe. And uh, what, it ten, what it looks to do is to look what is coming out from the grassroots and what's coming from the farmers itself, what kind of adaptations to climate change are coming, and tries to link that with decision makers. And so that this language actually starts happening more, more frequently and more, more fluidly. And uh, so, so that the policies that are coming from the top, they also uh, manifest what is needed on the ground and also can implement actually innovation that actually people are doing in the ground and not only theoretically. So Portugal, the rural area of Portugal is now being very desertifi desertified, both, both, by, uh, both by people moving out and also like people are getting older. The people that are staying are getting, very, very getting much older. There's a lot of abandonment of, uh, of, uh, of houses on the rural, of the rural life, livelihoods. And um, a lot of holiday houses, you know, that commuters that just go there once a year or something like that. Um, so this, this is actually very fertile ground for top-down measures because there's a lot of abandonment of land and so top-down measures tend to be very mono, mono, monolinear, no? Like it, they tend to, to, to identify for a particular patch of land uh, one pra practice that needs to be happening there and then give support for that. So what happens is that the rule becomes a kind of a bureaucratic landscape that you can actually just, just to, um, it kind of, it, it doesn't, it, it, it's not fluid with what actually the land act is, is needing and what is the land is asking. So in Portugal, you have a lot of eucalyptus plantation, uh, olive groves, but intensive olive groves, not the traditional one, pine plantation, a lot of uh, cow for, for meat, and, uh, and, but running free, no holistic grazing support on that. So at the same time, you have the, uh, a lot of young people going back into the countryside and trying to make a living from the, from the land. And what I'm focusing today here is on this movement and what's happening here. So, so a lot of, a lot of um, so these, 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 uh, these movements, they, because of their value systems, they lead with the landscape in a very different way. So they are changing the landscapes that they find. So you have, here is two examples. This one is in Tamara, where you have a, a, dry, a dry landscape, then with some, some water retention spaces, you, you, you kind of start regenerating the, the entire area. And on, on, the, on, the, on the edges of this lake, there's a lot of agroforestry uh, and ag uh, agroecological practices being, being practiced there. Another one is uh, landscapes that are overly grazed, then by because they are, were abandoned. So once the people living there around the house, that starts being renewed with a different kind of landscape. And um, this is in Herdade do Freixo do Meio. And I'll go back to these projects later on. So I'm basing my, my, my study on these two, two main frameworks. This one is social technological transition, and that one is social ecological systems resilience. What it, what, it, what, it, what it is is mainly, you have a set of mainstream practices, and this set is very, very stuck in itself because it has its own feedbacks that is feeding on each other. And then what you have is innovation coming up from, the, from, the, from different niches, and this can be different practices, the new, new tools that appear, so this comes in. And it, when it reaches the mainstream, it can uh, act with the mainstream in different ways, in, the, in diverse ways. So if it doesn't manage to communicate and, uh, and uh, interconnect with the, with the mainstream, it either fails or delays its interaction for future 
future times. And on the upper level, you have this kind of what is, for instance, climate change or economic pressure. So things that are happening more at the global level that if they break, then they also break the mainstream. And then there's, there's opportunities for, for these niches to actually uh, manifest themselves. And together with this, you have resilience theory. And uh, what I'm focusing here, because I, I don't want to go very deep into this, like the, is that once you, you create resilience at the local level, in your farm, in your small, small holding, it, if it gets extended to other scales, that resilience is actually affecting the, other, the, the upper resilience, as the opposite the same. So just a little bit of this framework. For this survey, what we've used, the methodolo methodology we used was this social ecological inventory. And it's basically what we, we so what we did was like, we, we, we started by identifying uh, like different permaculture key, key, key persons that were active in the movement. And then after that, also the groups, they were involved in other groups that, uh, that uh, were active. We, de we did a survey. Um, to interview these these uh, these the these permaculturists, and uh, then we did the, the data analysis and then the engagement with the movement. So, I'm I'm talking about the movement there, but I'm also a permaculturist, so I'm in in the movement itself. So it's I'm using a frame that is a uh, uh, auto uh, ethno bibliography that is using my own expression also as part of something, not studying something out there, but studying me in it because we are not actually separated from from what's surrounding us okay so why Portugal so we went uh, we went into the PRA uh, website and uh, we we've mapped like we, we just uh, see where how, how many projects were per country and Portugal appeared as the fifth country with the with more projects named there uh, uh, sorry and these are the their locations and the profiles of the people. But actually, if you then uh, cross it with the country area, Portugal appears as the one that has more projects per country, uh, per country area. And, um, and if you do it by country's population, it appears in fourth. And if it's by population density, it appears in, the, in tenth. So we, 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 we think that by an analyzing what's happening in Portugal, we can have a sense of part of the movement. And then that can be useful also for other groups to, to do their research and compare it with. Um, so this is uh, something that uh, our group is also f facilitating, that is the Red Convergir, is, a, is a, um, a mapping of all alternative projects in Portugal. And there's a, um, one of the categories is permaculture groups. And in 2014, we had 23 projects. 2015, we had 38. In the PRA, we have uh, 43 projects and the results of this survey actually showed 180 projects that people mentioned so this survey was done to 150 permaculturists all with PDCs so that was the, the their responses that uh, that uh, in a way uh, so this is one thing that I didn't thank, thank is that actually this knowledge is that their knowledge and it's a, a, a combination of this sharing of knowledge that uh, that is built collaboratively. So, to identify the different the different permaculturists, we did. So, we, last year we had the first permaculture conversions in Portugal, and where a lot of the movement came together. And uh, also, like, because being active, we know a lot of the people. And P Portugal is quite a small country, so we kind of know each other more more often. More more like. Sorry about my English. Sometimes I just say. Weird, weird words, but <laughs> sorry for that. It's better than our Portuguese. Yes. Yeah. So, <laughs> so how did we interview the, the people? So a lot of them were face to face, but then uh, it was taking a lot of time. So I just uh, put it in the, in the internet and I send emails to different groups, different people, and, uh, and then also through Facebook, in the conference, in the conversions, we had like a small thing with the, with the address and we give to all the people in the lunch line, that's a good place to have because it can get everyone on the lunch line. And, uh, and uh, that worked really well. So this was the survey, it's like a three page survey, very easy to answer, very fast. Uh, the first page is more demographic, 
then it's more about uh, uh, motivations. No, no, uh, what like the PDC data? Well, and then the last one is about motivations and perceptions of the people. So we did this to 150 people. This is the distribution of the of the people that answer where they were, where they were from. No, where they answered the 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 survey, and just that, just matching with the profiles. I just find this interesting. That's 1427, 1427, and it was something that happened back in. So in reaching the the, the picture, that was the mo more most boring part for me. It was just putting all the gra graphs together and having to spend some time in the computer with breaks to go to the garden and <laughs> just reroute. I think that's very important. And uh, so the, the idea of this survey is also that everyone that answered the survey will be receiving a, a report in the end. So all the 150 people will receive the information. And also uh, another thing that we wanted this to be a regenerative thing. So for each, each survey answered, there will be like a one fruit tree planted in one of the projects that will come up later. So, permaculture in Portugal, mostly. So we have we have more 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 men than than than, than women, and uh, it's uh, and the the nationality we have like 82 percent of the people are Portuguese, and we have 18 foreigners, 18 percent foreigners uh, activating permaculture in Portugal. And uh, most of them are from, from are actually from here, from the UK. Um, and this is very important because actually uh, we, uh, in in uh, in, uh, in another slide that I'm going to show, like we've seen that the permaculture in Portugal has been activated a lot by the link with the UK. So this is something that is for us is important. Um, so when asked about their profession. Like a lot of people identify their profession as permaculturists, and then farmers, teachers, some unemployed, and uh, designers, engineers, researchers, biologists. So the, the um, level of education is quite high. So a lot of people with bachelor's, master's, and some PhDs, 12th grade. So it's a, it's a um, well-schooled uh, community. You can discuss if this is good or bad, but then it's the, the, the characteristic of it. Uh, then a lot of like more like half of the people were living in rural areas so <laughs> there are these young young people that are going into the rural areas and um, and ah, I didn't so in the first where there was um, n uh, the, 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 like the gender uh, m female and, uh, and male though the it's also important to show that the all m the majority of the people are uh, around the ages of 30s like 30 somethings that's that's important because, you know, like in Portugal now we are facing a big, big unemployment at that particular age, people that come out from university and don't have a job. And, uh, and this is an important uh, factor for, for us to analyze what's happening here also. So fifth, half of the people are living in rural areas, some in peri-urban and uh, some in urban areas. Um, some have their own properties or families' properties, some rent. And uh, there's people with other types of property, people that are living in projects that they don't own the property, but they are living in projects. Most of the residences are, are, before, are less than two hectares and a half. And uh, within these two hectares and a half, a lot of them are la less than, than, uh, than half an hectare. Uh, so small properties. Although there's some big, big properties, more than 10, 10, 10 hectares. Uh, and that's the, the distribution of the residency of the people that answered the, the survey. So quite, quite well distributed. Also, this has something to do with the, with the density of the population in Portugal. A lot of people do live in, this, in, the, in the area around Lisbon. So that's also a, a method. So about the permaculture design certificates that the people in Portugal have taken. Uh, so their motivation. So a lot of... Most of the people have high levels of motivation in environmental, uh, their values of environmental motivation to attend the, the PDC. Then less a little bit for social, but still a lot, and less economical. So economical comes as a, as a medium, medium motivation. The m bigger motivation is really environmental values and environmental reasons. Um, 
Something that we found curious is that a lot of people didn't find that unemployment was a motivation for going and taking a PDC, and also little to find a new career. So it's very, it's very like a paradigm shifting. So it's like there's a big disbelief in Portugal about the, the, uh, the employment system. So, so what, we, what we are reading from this is that, that a lot of the people actually are looking for a different alternative. And, uh, and then actually what they want is to ground their lifestyles, change their lifestyles. Some want to start agricultural activities, but a lot of them actually want to acquire new skills. And um, I find this interesting because a lot of people with high schooling, uh, schooling aptitude, no? But to actually looking for acquiring new skills. And this is something that I find interesting in this. In this. Uh, the PDCs in Port uh, that people from Portugal took, they are, they are uh, so uh, there's a crescendo here. And a lot of it reached a peak. Here in 2012, a lot of people are, were taking PDCs at this, age, at this uh, time here, and then it decreased a little bit. And we're finding it that a lot of PDCs are actually uh, being cancelled because there's a lot of offer and uh, l less, less interest in taking PDCs. Uh, so the green, the green margin is the, the PDCs that were taken outside of Portugal, and the red is the ones that were taken in Portugal already. And from outside of Portugal, a lot of people went to United Kingdom, Thailand, Spain, Slovenia. And uh, the nationality of the teacher. So I divided it in teacher one and teacher two, so assistant. And on teacher one, you have a big, big number of uh, people ans answered English and, uh, and then other, other nationalities. And then the second teacher, you have a big, big number of Portuguese. So, and you also have already, like for the fir first teachers, a lot of Portuguese also. So, so, so what we're reading from this, and actually it's a moment to honor this, this, this lady is Leslie Martin, and she's one, uh, like she really brought with a lot of energy the, the permaculture concept into Portugal, and it was one of the first to actually do a lot of PDCs and teach a lot of the people there. Uh, so I'm going to speed a little bit up. I only have 10 minutes now. So a lot of people are, most of all the people are applying what they've learned in the PDCs. And uh, as designers, a lot. Some as trainers, but still a big, mar a big uh, number. And, but majority of, the, of them are using it actually as a lifestyle. The income from permaculture, there's a big, big number of people that actually are not earning any income from permaculture. Although there's 20% that, no, there's the, the, like 10% that are actually earning 20% of, the, of their income through permaculture, and some that are actually earning 100% income from permaculture activities. Per the perception and participation of the, of the, of the um, Portuguese permaculture movement. So the questions were, if you consider yourself part of the permaculture movement, and people said yes, but people said also partly. So there's people that, although they are doing permaculture, they don't identify themselves as part of the movement. Uh, but a big number identifies itself. Um, if they identify themselves with the actions that the permaculture movement in Portugal are having, we have less saying that they, 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 identi that they identify with, and a lot of people with partially. So you have like an ambiguous uh, idea of what's happening in, a, in, a, in Portugal. Do you think the movement is changing the landscapes in, in which it acts towards higher levels of resilience? Then you have a lot of people saying yes. Again, some people saying partly. Do you think the, do you think the movement is having impact in the creation of more resilient social in, uh, alternatives? Some say yes, a lot partly. Do you think there is an adaptation of the permaculture practices to the biogeographic reality of Portugal? The same, same conclusions. Do you think the movement have a bottom-up grassroots approach? A lot of say yes, and some partially, but when asked if they have a top-down approach, almost no one said that they, they, they agree with it, although some did, and uh, a lot of say that it's not a top-down uh, top approach. So this is the last que question, but it still has some slides in it. So the last question was for the movement identi identify six different projects in Portugal that were referenced for them. 
So in the educational side, in a single family farm, an eco village, an ecological project, a social and economic project, and these are the results. So the educational one is Quinta Valdelama. It's down south, it's close to, this is the one close to where I live. And uh, so it's a 44 hectare farm with the educational project and a, a regenerative agricultural system around, the, around their property. They have an eco resort and they have a community living in. So, so you have a lot of activities with youth. You have uh, holistic grazing uh, with the sheep and chickens. They are here, they are together, but they actually go one after the other. Compost toilets. Uh, agroforestry practices with helicropping, but this is like based on the traditional uh, uh, methods of Portugal that is like uh, sunken beds and um, uh, so a lot of so there's a lot of focus on being self producing of vegetables and uh, it's focused a lot on community living also but but it's not a, a, an eco village so it's a, a community of people that work there so if you stop working there then you you, you need to move up. So the eco village one, it's uh, Tamara. Tamara is like a, a big eco village. It's like uh, 200 hectares uh, and uh, has uh, 150 people living there. And it can come <coughs> in the summer to 400 people with the visitors and guests. So the, the uh, Valdelama has uh, 12 people living in it and uh, with volunteers and uh, internships goes to 20. Uh, Tamara is very focused on this water retention scape, uh, landscape, so it, uh, Sepp also went there and did this amazing design for a lot of, lot of, uh, a lot of um, different, uh, different uh, dams and, uh, and also the agroecology processes that's happening around the lakes. They, are they have something called the solar village that is focusing on alternative technologies, biogas systems, as, uh, like different greenhouses with solar and stirring engines and l like a lot of innovation in that sense. Uh, it's a big community, it's a free love community, so it's very into the study of what, how to make peace in the world through the peace in relationships. Uh, it's a very interesting project and we are very fortunate to have it in Portugal. It's mainly, uh, it was started by Germans, mainly Germans, and, uh, but now it's a multitude of, of, of cultures living here. Um, the single family farm is a, is a, that, so it's Quinta do Boiço, it's a forest garden. It, it, it's situated a little bit center north from in Portugal, and it's uh, from a, a British uh, couple, uh, and there, so they, there's a couple and three kids that were live here, then when time of high school they left and came to England to study. And uh, so it's very forest garden-like, a lot of the plants there comes from Martin Crawford's and are being tested there to see the adaptation of the, those varieties to the Portuguese reality. So, so it's mainly like a lot of uh, the different stacking of the different uh, um, structure in the, in the food forest uh, process. The ecological one. Uh, so uh, first it came Tamara, the eco village I told you, then Quinta de Valdelama, the educational project but because they were already mentioned for those typologies and with more votes. Uh, then Terra Mada is another, another project down south, also in the Algarve, but in the east. And uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's started by a, a French couple, uh, sailors, that uh, arrived and settled there. And uh, then they, they so it's six, seven, six hectares. It's a six hectare farm. They have um, also agroforestry, they have uh, uh, like some, some water retention spaces, uh, some uh, alternative energy, wind, wind and, and solar. They, have, like, they are trying different natural building materials and the different uh, alternative uh, building structures. Um, and then the social project is uh, actually a, a project in within a village, an alter uh, a traditional village and uh, it's called uh, uh, Centro de Convergência of Aldeia das Amoreiras and it's a village that was getting old and a bunch of uh, like a bunch of uh, urban uh, activists just went to the village start living with the community and doing different 
experiments for them to learn, for the community to learn with them. And uh, they've done a permaculture design for the entire village with the collaboration of the, of the community. And uh, they, they, are, they appear in the um, Transition 2.0 video. So they are a, a, a transition village. And uh, they actually activate a lot the, the old people that were living to create a dream. What is the dream town, their dream town? And, uh, and there was a lot of engagement. And the wishes that were made were tried to fulfilled by the people themselves. So it was a really interesting. It's really focused on traditional re uh, re-emerging or something like that so getting old school old still all the skills back to life with the permaculture uh, view view in a way uh, the economic one is uh, one called Freixo do Maio Herdade do Freixo do Maio this is a more than 600 hectare farm that it's uh, owned by um, so he this guy inherit this farm from his family and uh, and um, he wanted to do something alternative, and he's doing something in uh, nat like uh, uh, high nature value systems on the Montado. It's the agro silver pastoral system that I told you before. And after a while, he, in, he wanted to have more people living there, so he he kind of leased certain parts of the property to different people. And there's a couple that is moved there to start their permaculture project. They don't have to pay, they just have to develop the, the place. So it's kind of a, a change, a, 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 shared, a, share, a shared process. So they live there, they, have, um, they are very focused. They have a five hectare um, key line orchard that it's, uh, that the, where they use the, the, the yeoman's, yeoman's plow to between, between the trees and all the trees are in key line. So these actually activated the, the, the owner to now make a design for 150 hectares, all in key line. So this is still in design phase. It's already done, the design. So it's now getting the funds to implement it. And this is a se second step. But it's something that is happening. So this was the result still now. And this is just a survey. And now the next step is to that we already visit all these projects and we engage with them in the first, first uh, as the first approach. But now the idea is to actually link these projects and highlight through, through a resilient assessment of each of the, of the farms and a pilgrimage between the farms to highlight the value system that is behind the, the, the people that are, run, that are dealing with those landscapes and also highlight the analytical, more landscape ecology type patchiness and uh, the diversity of patchiness and indices more. So m merge the two the two worlds, the analytical one with a more soulful and holistic uh, approach. And thank you very much. And thank you. Thank you very much. If we have a few technical questions just on that presentation, and then we can open it up for a few minutes. So any points of clarification, first of all? So were you saying that 80% of the people are going back to their land are actually Portuguese youth? Yeah. Yeah, 80% yeah, of the people that answered the, the, the survey. A lot of them are going back to the land. Some aren't. So it's not like all of them are going into the, into the land. But it's a big percentage that people are. There's different ways where people are going back to the land. Uh, some still have links with family in the in the country because until seventy four we were a very rural country and after for uh, after seventy four the so the country started uh, entering more a neoliberal uh, approach to to and a lot of the people start moving to the into the city so but a lot of the grandparents that were in the in the countryside they're still there so there's some people that are realize that the life they were looking in the in the city or their parents were looking in the city was not actually uh, fulfilling their needs and so some of them are going back to their communities and and starting to do something a lot of people already lost the connection with land 
but still have connection with family. So they still can get the skills, but not the land. So for them, it's a little bit dip more difficult. And, uh, and then you have a percentage that are foreigners that are coming and buying pieces of land and, uh, and then developing, developing their, 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 their projects. And that's also something that is you know, very linked to, to, to what's happening in the movement. So that's, yeah. No. No, no. The squatted movement was after 74 and it was from the people that were working in the aristoc aristocracy kind of properties. There were big properties and people were working in it and after the revolution there was a, a kind of a, so they occupied those lands that they were working. But after two, three years, a lot of these, so there was a kind of a counter, counter movement and uh, a lot of these lands were again again uh, appropriated so a lot of these people were put out there are some exceptions but it's not on these exceptions actually that you are seeing permaculture so so the permaculture now is mm, there's some uh, like ownership is difficult it's not is uh, okay it's difficult if i compare with england probably not because a lot of the land here is very difficult to access and there there is easier uh, but the thing is more the economic, like people are not able to have the, so much income that they can go and, 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 and uh, you know, uh, buy land easily. But people are coming together. There's examples of cooperatives. We have a good example of a colleague of us that uh, created a cooperative. And through that cooperative, they are actually renting a place but with the idea of one day buying the place together. So there's some examples, but, but yeah, within those lines. Rebecca, do you want to come forward and then we can, rather than being specifically on that presentation, we can open it out. Mm. That's a great presentation, mm. by the way. And the, I love the song. <laughs> yeah, I've, 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 I've had a lot of oh, sessions in my time. I've never had any, any music in them before. Well, I think it's a great um, start. I might do the same next time. <laughs> <laughs> Good. And if I can just make one observation that might help kick things off. It's interesting the balance in the two talks between the biophysical measures, which are difficult to assess in many ways, whereas what you've come in, in is much more of the social measures and social capital, which is actually more visible. But both of you reflect that in order to understand that, you need to understand the story of the individual holding. Mm -hmm. Yes, uh, it's interesting. I mean, in the past I've done research more like what you've done um, about the back to the land movement and looking at how people don't get burnt out when they're working on the land. And so and that's much more where I feel at home. <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and for me, it's very, very good be to have your presentation because that's the, where I'm stepping in now. Yes. It's like going in. So it, now in each, in each of the projects, of mm -hmm. the six projects that were named, in each of them, there will be a more analytical analysis yes. of, of of their of their mostly of their design and how their mm -hmm. their design is going on. So, uh, mm -hmm. so I would have to look also into some mm -hmm. of the product productivity of it yes. and see also to relate it also to other 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 process of uh, of um, of of also translating it to other other types of of uh, public that uh, somehow mm, um, are aiming to, and their motivation is going more into the productive side of, 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 of it. Yeah. Okay. And, uh, I have one over there, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, I guess my question is still mainly to you, bro, because uh, mm. you put it in the context of the whole social te technological mm. regime framework, mm -hmm. and the way you presented it made me think as if it were still, you know, like these, innovations on the site and I was wondering how much they actually affect the regime. Mm -hmm. So are they enclaves or are they um, outposts? Mm -hmm. So so at this particular moment I cannot answer the, the what they are at the moment because it, it's through the through the 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 analysis that is happening that will happen within each project 
that I will identify what their link is with the mainstream. So how they are reaching their local authorities, how they are reaching the landscape surrounding them. So I would have to say until now that it's still a niche, that it's not yet linked, although there are some linkages. So things like, for instance, this year in the eighth grade, there was one page in the eighth grade of permaculture there. there. And mm. so, you know, there's minor things. Uh, so other things is, um, is uh, for instance, we. I think what I have to say is that I cannot distance myself as a researcher from the engagement that the niche is having in the mainstream. So me as a researcher, and I can say a group, the group I'm working as, as, a, as the group that it is, its aim also to interact and be active in that linkage with the mainstream. So what to, we've done in the past, some other colleague, is actually getting different farmers together and the, the practices being shared between them. So I don't have an answer about where it is in the social technolo technological um, re uh, multi-level regime. I don't have it yet. The question would be if they change their practice, right? That exactly, exactly. So it needs, so you need to, to be able to measure that in terms of how do you see the regime changing. And uh, I still don't have data on it to be able to, to tell you in a concrete way. I could be very positive and link what I, my perception is, but I want to defer from my perception and mm -hmm. want to, to be able to answer you when I have data to answer you. Because now my perception is that uh, it had more momentum in the past, now is lowering a little bit. But that's my perception. But it might be different. I, d I need to be more, I, d I need to have the data for, for answering that. And what's happening in the UK? Because from the way you describe mm -hmm. it, I got the impression that the UK sites were a lot less experimental in many ways. It was just individuals with a few hectares of land doing stuff. Yes, I mean, there were a whole variety of different people and places that took part in my survey. I mean, I think there still is very much a sort of a division between the, the more alternative type farms and the um, more conventional type farms. And I mean, in the Land Workers Alliance, we're trying to sort of build alliances, particularly with, for example, the Family Farmers Association, who encapsulate traditional family farmers, but who are actually, I think, being squeezed and more threatened than um, a lot of the smaller scale farms. I mean, I think the smaller scale farms are on the increase, but the family farms are really um, being squeezed out from either side at the moment. Um, so, yes, but there is, there is interaction between them. But I think it's a very difficult thing to measure in a, in a quantitative way. I have no idea how you'd measure impact. Um, I think you have to do it through observation. Mm. Okay, there's a question up there. Um, my question was actually almost exactly the same. Oh, well, then we'll, we'll that was answered. Right, okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, my question was also almost the same. <laughs> 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 okay, we've got another one over there. No, 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 I want to add to that. Uh, in, your, in the survey results, there was one answer where it said, uh, do you think that what these projects in the Arctic culture movement is doing doesn't have a large impact on uh, the food production or the landscape? Mm -hmm. uh, So, so the survey was done to 150 right. permaculturists. All of them are permaculturists. And so those results there are from their answers. And uh, in terms, like I have a, a confidence interval of eight, uh, and this means that there's like 8% more. So, so what is, so basically, that answers the perception of the permaculturists. It doesn't answer the perception of the, of, of the mainstream. So, so they perceive it as having a good impact in the creation of more resilient landscapes. And, and going back to the question that, that was repeated in a way, 
like one thing that I'm seeing is that you know small initiatives have ripple effects and uh, what I one of the examples is the one in the Herdad do, do Freixo do Maio that is the one of the key line orchard so it's a small initiative done by permaculturists in a five hectare plot that then influences a mainstream farmer that uh, now upscales it to 150 in 50 hectares uh, and this farmer is more linked with the uh, with other 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 stakeholders no other other that are not as alternative as as uh, as the permaculture movement can be sorry no, no, no. We, we have a question over here we can talk later I'm Jill I I come from a, a, a participatory action research, and uh, it's two different worlds if you're trying to work with and for <coughs> permaculturists, but also at the same time influencing research and policy makers. We're talking about different languages, different data, different indicators, how easy, challenges, and how do you foresee your work going through it? How mm -hmm. are you dealing with it? Mm -hmm. Um, well, I mean, did, did you want, no, we no, can both, first. okay, well, I mean, it's really interesting you should raise that, because for me, doing this research is sort of exploding a lot of ideas I had about the role of academics, mm -hmm. um, and cer certainly the Centre for Agroecology, Water and Resilience, have a very sort of radically different approach, I'm finding, <coughs> because I've always thought, well, as an academic, you need to be sort of dispassionate, you need to be sort of not apolitical about what you're doing and sort of like an outside observer. And just this week, in fact, one of the people who's helping supervise me came and did a presentation to a group of us in the Land Workers Alliance and it was about transform transformative research. And it was amazing seeing how he was doing research in Canada with small-scale farmers and... Um, helping them develop their marketing networks and from an academic position actually being quite an activist and um, one of the reasons that they're working with the Land Workers Alliance is that they're very keen to have um, what they're calling, calling democratising agricultural research um, and so getting research being done by the farmers and getting farmers to sort of set the research agenda so that rather than it being a sort of extractive exercise with researchers going into farming communities and asking lots of questions and writing reports and then the farmers never see them again. Um, actually getting the farmers to say, well, actually, these are the things that we think are important and then making sure that the researchers and the farmers or the researchers might be the farmers are um, sort of getting the results back to the other people that need them. So I think there's... There's a lot of blurring of lines going on at the moment, and I, I have to admit I've questioned myself sometimes whether, whether it's appropriate that I'm doing research on productivity, which we're wanting to use to influence policy, um, and whether I'm going to bring my own biases into it. And I guess I just have to try and be very strict with myself and realistic and sort of have a lot of discipline not to do that um, but I think you can also bring a much, a lot, a lot more richness to it, because you have a much greater understanding of the movement and the problems, and and I think there's also a greater element of trust. Would you say you found that people are more willing to open up to you and take part because you're another permaculturist? Mm -hmm. I think yeah, I really like the that yes. you mentioned transformative research because, yes. like, for me personally, I cannot be anyone else than me. Yes. You know, that's only what I can be. If I'm doing research, I'm doing research as Ugu as yes. I am, no? So if I'm trying to, like, I've been challenged or, uh, uh, before in, in this question of bias, you know? Are you bringing your bias because you're a permaculturist? Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, everyone is, you know? Yes. Everyone is bringing yes. their biases. Just because our biases are more m aligned with the mainstream or less aligned with the mainstream, then this is just a matter of, of, of normal, normalization, you know? And uh, I think that personally, and the, this is how I'm going to lead research on, is I need to acknowledge what I, what I am as a researcher. 
and, and have that as a transformation in myself, also allow that transformation to happen. And then what I can do is that document that. So that's why I, what I've talked before about auto, uh, auto ethnobiography is like you can, you, can, you can link what you're studying with, with, with what you are. And, uh, and this is for me like the way I would like to approach research. And, mm -hmm. and I know that the, the norm, it's not that one. And the norm is to, for you to distance and be something other, like something different from, uh, from what the research is. Like if you could be something, like if you could be invisible, and it's, it's impossible, you cannot never be invisible. I'm going to close it there. I think that's a really nice place to end this. And because everyone needs a chance to have a drink, have a bit of a fresh, mm -hmm. another stretch. But meanwhile, two lovely presentations. Thank you very, very much. <laughs>
we want to keep speaking to the members. We really want the members to have an yeah. opportunity to get the time. <laughs>